<laughs> Go ahead, say a quick Andrew. question. Yes. Um, can you tell us a bit about Kapia? Kapia, Kapia, Kapi is a Pali Pali word for um, to uh, allowing or making something allowable, and because there's so many things that the monks cannot do. Uh, we don't handle money, for example. Uh, we we relinquish uh, any kind of cooking our own food, or we can't uh, even keep food for more than one day. And we have to, for example, we have to eat before noon. And so kapiyas are people that help monks uh, in this uh, in this. Um, in their endeavor. <laughs> and how did you meet um, um, Kapia in Holland, Bante? Well, that was at uh, at the center in Missouri. Um, I was I was at the the center there with my teacher and um, at Damasuka, and uh, Kuhn flew in for a retreat and um, did a couple of weeks retreat. He did a temporary ordination. He uh, ordained as a Samanera for a couple of weeks and I, uh, I helped him, you know, knowing the basics and um, how to put on a robe, for example. <laughs> and um, a, a bit of guiding through uh, the proper uh, behavior and uh, the ordination ceremony. So, uh, and we've we've kept contact since then, and he's he's been very uh, helpful and uh, yeah, uh, contributing along with many others, in fact, but uh, contributing f to make this happen. <laughs> in many ways. <laughs> sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Yes. Did you say that you you are not able to cook um, food for yourself? But I was just curious mm -hmm. if that was true and, and why would that be? Well, uh, monks, it's simply put, it's uh, because monks uh, relinquish taking anything. So even food. Uh, that's why we uh, everything uh, that we that we use is given to us uh, basically so we are the only way that monks can be alive and uh, doing what they do is through uh, generosity basically <laughs> and so without generosity there's no monks <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. or very hungry monks, <laughs> and this keeps. Um, mm -hmm. And may I share a story with you in this like that regard with everyone? So in Sri Lanka, we had um, um, about a hundred thousand, close to hundred thousand monks um, passed in the history because that was uh, for na for my time. Uh, like this, like food, and people had nothing to give. Um, so it's written in the history books that people, um, monks uh, all over the country came near Ruan, Ruan Mahavali Saya and sat down and prayed for good health and peace for everyone, and everybody died at the same time. So Hmm. Thank you for sharing this story. <laughs> and uh, well, I think we can begin now. Yeah. And we'll do the same same thing as usual, same schedule. We'll start with half an hour of loving kindness. Hi, Gray. <laughs> and then I'll be speaking a bit about... Uh, the whole of the spiritual life, uh, which is a beautiful friendship or a good friendship tonight. And so f to begin with, you can simply close your eyes and take a posture that is comfortable to you. 
and relax your entire body. Doesn't matter if you're sitting on the ground or on the bed or on a chair, as long as you feel comfortable. A position in which it is easy for you to feel at ease and feel happy. This will help us for this loving kindness meditation. And whatever your train of thought was just at this moment, whatever you've been thinking all day, or whatever has been on your mind this week, or whatever plans that you've been making, simply put it all down now. Let it go. You can even take a deep breath. and smile. If there's any tension anywhere in your body, simply try to relax it, let it go. and smile. If there's any tension in your mind, allow it to fade away, to pass. Relax your eyes. Your whole face. Your shoulders. And notice how good it feels just to be here now and to relax. Simply allow yourself to be happy here and now. And smiling does help quite a bit. You might notice the awareness of your whole body becomes quite clear. In fact, the awareness of your own body is always there. You only need to let go of everything else to feel it. 
you don't need to do anything about it, really. Only relax. And smile. This is a happy meditation. Smiling meditation. It's okay to be happy. just by yourself. feel like you've relaxed your whole body and mind enough to be comfortable and happy. Whenever you are ready, you can bring up this feeling of loving kindness within your heart. The feeling of loving kindness is a very tangible feeling within your body. It's this soft, warm, glowing, perhaps radiant feeling inside your chest. Perhaps it's the same feeling that you get when you play with a child, when you hold a baby. Or perhaps a puppy or any kind of small animal that you like. It might be a beautiful place for you in nature somewhere or doing something that you really love. You can use any of these objects to help you bring up this warm, glowing feeling inside your chest. Or perhaps the feeling for you comes up very naturally and the object feels like a little too heavy. That's fine as well. The important part 
about this is for you to be able to feel the feeling of love within your whole body. Starting within your heart, and slowly pervading, suffusing your whole body. And smiling will always help you, will always bring you back on the right track. It might feel a bit forced and awkward at times, but soon enough it will become natural, genuine. We simply have to nudge the smile along sometimes. But that's okay. And remembering that the Buddha taught seven factors that lead to awakening, that support awakening. And joy is one of them. Therefore, enjoy this feeling of loving-kindness. Throughout your whole body. without forcing too much, putting just enough energy 
so that the feeling of love can come up. If it brings up tension, simply relax, let go, don't try too hard. And whenever you feel like it, when you've had your fill of loving kindness inside your body, you might notice that naturally it wants to overflow. It doesn't feel like being contained. Then let it flow out everywhere in front of you. To all living beings. everywhere behind you to all living beings everywhere to your left to all living beings everywhere to your right to all living beings love above you and below you everywhere without any resentment without any anger only love goodwill to all living beings in the boundless universe without any judgment without any opinions 
without any critical thought, just love, boundless, measureless. Apamano. See how good it feels to only have love for all living beings. Now your mind might become distracted sometimes. It might start wondering, thinking about this, thinking about that. What happened yesterday? What you will do tomorrow? Now whatever it is, Every time you notice your mind is wandering, notice the slight tension that comes with it. Whether it's somewhere in your body, but most likely in your head. and release, relax that tension, let go of that thought, let it be there by itself. Smile and come back to the feeling of loving kindness. And this is wise practice. the sixth spoke of the path. And this is also wisdom. seeing tension when it arises, letting it go, abandoning it, and coming back to a wholesome feeling. As we do this naturally, our mindfulness becomes sharper and our ability to stay with the loving kindness becomes stronger.
at any point you might notice that bringing any kind of object or thinking is too heavy, is too coarse and simply staying with just the feeling of loving kindness is much better that's wonderful that is a good sign the mind getting purer just like the sun it's not thinking about shining its light throughout the universe it simply is Simply allow this beautiful feeling of loving kindness to shine outwards naturally. Bhavatu sabba mangalangra kanta sabba devata sabba buddhanu bhavena sada sati bhavantu te Bhavatu sabba mangalangra kanta sabba devata sabba dhammanu bhavena sada sati bhavantu te Bhavatu sabba mangalangra kantu sabba devata sabba sanganu bhavena sarasati bhavantu te sadhu 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 May all blessings be upon you and may all the devas protect you by the powers of all the buddhas, the dhamma and the sangha May you be well and happy. Now carrying with you this beautiful feeling that we've been cultivating for half an hour into the second portion of our little gathering. And tonight's sutta is the Megiya Sutta, which talks about a very important 
aspect of the spiritual life or simply put the path to happiness and this is a uh, kalyana mitatta that's the pali that the buddha called it virtuous friendship or beautiful friendship that's what the word kalyana means mitatta and we just finished a series of talk about the gradual training, the threefold training, trainings of sila, morality or virtue, samadhi, meditation, and panya, discernment or wisdom, which is also the Eightfold Path. Uh, and uh, the supporting condition for all of this to arise, the Buddha said, was um, like he said in one of the suttas in the numerical discourses, uh, Parato Goso, um, wise wisdom or wise uh, understanding comes from two things uh, careful attention and the voice of another and so it is very uh, quite important uh, uh, on the path this cultivation of virtuous friendship in fact there's even uh, a sutta where Ananda uh, the Buddha's assistant goes to the Buddha and says oh Bhante this surely is at least half of the holy life, of the spiritual life. That virtuous friendship, at least half of the holy life. And the Buddha replied, Surely not, Ananda, surely not. <laughs> it is surely the whole of the spiritual life, the whole of the path. Because without, without good friendship, well, this whole thing would not be possible. And in a way, it underlines how we all affect everybody around us and the people who we choose to uh, associate with. And that we are not alone on this path. And to choose wisely uh, who we surround ourselves with and the role of virtuous friendship which also helps us always stay on the path and that is the definition of a good friend someone that pushes us along on the path uh, to happiness to more happiness to more discernment and so this uh, this sutta here um, is speaking a little bit more about this and um, the Venerable Magiya at this point, this was before the Ananda uh, became the Buddha's assistant. So Magiya, Venerable Magiya at this point was uh, the Buddha's assistant for a short period of time. And they were traveling along the country. And this uh, Magiya wanted to go for alms to town. And as it di he did so, uh, he came back and uh, stumbled upon a very beautiful mango grove <laughs> as he was walking for exercise along the river. And he really, he really liked this mango grove and he thought, well, I'll come back here to meditate later this afternoon. And he came back and asked the Buddha about... Uh, if he could leave and uh, and go to that beautiful mango grove to meditate and they were by themselves at that point and the Buddha said since we are alone Magiya simply wait a little longer so that some other bhikkhus some other monks can can join us and um, and then you can go 
not to leave the Buddha alone. <laughs> uh, and then Megiya was had quite a bit of restlessness in his mind <laughs> and was really uh, intent and really wanted strongly to go and meditate uh, the mango grove. And so he kind of told the Buddha, well, Bhante, you, the Buddha has nothing more to do because he's awakened, <laughs> but I am not. <laughs> and so I, I, need to, I need to strive more, I need to meditate more, so please allow me to go to meditate at the mango grove. And a second time and a third time the Buddha said the same thing, but the third time the Buddha conceded and said, well, Magiya, what can I say to you since you speak about striving in meditation? <laughs> Just go. <laughs> and uh, only from the mental state of Magiya at this point, uh, we can tell he's, he's a bit restless. He's a bit agitated to really want to put his... Uh, <laughs> drive his point uh, and really leave the Buddha alone so that he can meditate uh, even though it's a very virtuous endeavor uh, kind of tells us the state of his mind <laughs> and then he went to the mango grove and uh, interestingly he could not meditate because his mind was overrun by all kinds of thoughts he wanted he remembered so basically, Megiya was a king in his past lives, uh, but also uh, in that present life, that in the suttas, and uh, was very uh, used to luxurious kingly pleasures, and um, these all came rushing into his mind at that point, and not seeing, uh, not having discernment sharp enough to to see that his mind was just way too agitated and uh, then he had some some anger also arising because of that and some some thoughts of harming even and then he thought well this is interesting i became a monk to <laughs> abandon all these unwholesome thoughts and now they just come rushing into my mind how is that possible? And then he goes back to the Buddha and tells him everything that just happened, that he just couldn't meditate. And the Buddha, and this is where I'll be reading the, the Sutta, this is from the Udana, uh, the utterances of the, the Buddha, short utterances. And the Buddha replies to him, Megiya, when mind deliverance is as yet immature, Five things lead to its maturity. What five? Here, Megiya, a seeker has good friends, good associates, and good companions. When mind deliverance is as yet immature, Megiya, this is the first thing that leads to its maturity. Now, this beautiful friendship here comes first, in fact. Furthermore, Megiya, a seeker is virtuous. He lives master of himself by the mastery of the Patimoka. The Patimoka is the rules of the monks. Uh, the monks have merely 227 <laughs> virtuous rules to follow. But technically, um, in the lay life, we, we only emphasize five major um, virtue uh, that we we say the first one is not harming any living beings on purpose the second one is um, not to take anything that's not given briefly not stealing which is all it's all about simply being a good person really the third one is abstaining from uh, sensual or sexual misconduct then the fourth is refraining from lying just speaking the truth and this protects others and this protects us at the same time and the fifth one is not to indulge in any substances that dull the mind or make render us uh, heedless 
And that is really what virtue is in this point, at this, in this case. Endowed with conduct and knowledge, seeing danger in the smallest faults, he trains in the training rules he has accepted. When mind deliverance is as yet immature, Magiya, this is the second thing that leads to its maturity. And then we have good friendship and then virtue. Furthermore, Magiya, a bhikkhu obtains at will with no trouble or difficulty. Talk that is about effacement, a help in opening up the heart. This means effacement here is to relinquish pride, relinquish conceit, which comes with a lot of tension and comes with a lot of trouble in our lives. And further speaks about uh, being able to hear talks that help in opening up the heart and the mind, which is what we speak about all the time, releasing, relaxing, bringing up the loving kindness, abandoning the unwholesome which comes with tension and cultivating something, uh, states of mind that come with opening, that come with allowing, acceptance, forgiveness. and which conduces to complete contentment, calming down, release, peace, direct knowledge through meditation, and awakening Nibbana. That is, talk about fewness of wishes, not, to, not that it's bad to wish for certain things. In fact, um, this is one of the most misunderstood misunderstood um, teaching in Buddhism is that it's not about well yes the end goal is to r relinquish uh, craving gradually but there is also what we call chanda and chanda is a wholesome desire in fact we we very much need wholesome desires in our lives to direct ourselves and to direct our lives to wholesome things, wholesome states. And, and fewness of desires here is, is about also uh, discerning, discerning which kind of desires are really helping us and which ones were just piling up tension in our lives. And so be able to sort it through. Talk about contentment. Talk about seclusion, and this is not only physical seclusion, but the Buddha talked about viveka, which is what he called seclusion, uh, not, be, uh, not becoming too distracted, but this is also uh, meditation, mental collectedness, samadhi. Viveka is, in fact, a synonym for Nibbana. Talk about solitude, and solitude is in, a, in an accessible way that we can explain it as definitely learning how to be just happy by ourselves, <laughs> learning to be happy with ourselves, and that's, that's the very foundation of happiness. If we're not happy by ourselves, how can we be happy with others or in general. Talk about putting forth energy, not being lousy or lazy. Talk about virtue, talk about meditation, talk about wisdom, talk about deliverance, and talk about the knowledge and vision of deliverance. Now, the knowledge and vision of deliverance is basically the direct experience when there's distraction in the mind, when there's anger in the mind, there's tension, there's that this is not happiness. We need the discernment to see this. When there's anger arising, jealousy or envy or something uh, like a, a coarse, tense state, um, to be able to see this, to be able to let it go and tangibly 
the knowledge and vision of liberation is simply just to be able to see these things. It's not only about the final goal, Nibbana, but it's also Nibbana, here and now, calming down here and now, enjoying release here and now. Furthermore, Megiya, a bhikkhu, a seeker, lives with energy instigated for the abandoning of unwholesome qualities and the acquire, in the acquiring of wholesome qualities. One is vigorous, energetic, and persevering with regard to wholesome states. Now, every time the Buddha talked about energy, he talked about right effort or wise practice, which is abandoning the unwholesome and cultivating the wholesome. And by doing this, uh, this supports mindfulness. Mindfulness grows out of the soil of wise practice. When mind deliverance is as yet immature magiya, this is the fourth thing that leads to its maturity. Furthermore, magiya, a bhikkhu is wise, endowed with noble, the noble one's penetrative understanding of rise and disappearance, leading to the complete ending of tension. Now what this means is to see when the unwholesome states arise, for example, anger or jealousy, to see it as unpleasant and to let it go. That's the disappearance. The letting go is the disappearance. And to constantly train to see things as, in fact, it's always just changing and flowing. <laughs> this really helps us not to cling too hard, not to take things so seriously all the time and be light in general to the things that are happening to us and to remain in wisdom. When mind deliverance is as yet immature, Magiya, these five things lead to its maturity. And now this uh, part is quite uh, important here. It is to be expected of a bhikkhu who has good, good friends, good associates, good companions, that that person will be virtuous. And now this is basically, uh, he's, he's going through the, five, the four things again. Uh, it is to be expected to, that this seeker, that this person, will get to hear these talks. It is to be expected to, that this person will live energetically, with energy instigated for the abandoning of unwholesome states and the cultivating of wholesome ones. And it is to be expe expected that this seeker that has good friends will be wise and endowed with wisdom. And here we're just simply looping back to the virtuous friendship, which is the whole of the path. It is the support for the whole path to arise. These people that we choose to surround ourselves with, that we spend time with. And that by cultivating good friendship, we in a way, this is our best insurance <laughs> that we will stay on the path and uh, keep cultivating the right way. A seeker, Magiya, who is established in these five things should also cultivate four additional things. Now we're back to the, the numbers in Buddhism. <laughs> And here are four meditation techniques that the Buddha taught because the Buddha taught different ways of cultivating the mind for different people that had different inclinations of the mind. And some people have very strong desires for certain things. For, for some people it's food. Some people really have strong uh, tension around food <laughs> or uh, judgments or opinions. Some people 
have more of a tendency to lean towards impatience or anger. That's more, their food is not so much of a problem, it's more the inclination is more to uh, aversion or impatience. And some people have more um, need for cultivating uh, certain things like joy or um, <laughs> developing, strengthening what they need to strengthen. And so here he says, Oh. Foulness should be cultivated for overcoming uh, strong desires. So this is one way. We I don't really speak about this very often because it's not. Uh, it's only in very specific case that I would suggest to practice foulness meditation but for someone that has um, especially a young yeah, young men that would uh, have to uh, that's what my teacher would say uh, that would have to go and have some exams and um, would only think about uh, uh, that beautiful woman beside them and couldn't concentrate well they can just uh, see that well really that body is simply uh, uh, hair and skin and nails and <laughs> so that they can break through this this uh, really uh, this obsession of the mind because sometimes uh, we have these obsessions that come up and without this pushing this line of <laughs> meditation too far. Um, and then he says, loving kindness should be cultivated for overcoming anger. And loving kindness has other wonderful qualities, but that is one, one of the purposes why the, the Buddha taught loving kindness to a lot of, to a lot of monks. Because uh, this is not only about anger, but impatience is a sort of anger also. And um, loving kindness is such a wholesome state. Uh, the Buddha said uh, that the mind quickly enters meditation or samadhi as soon as we practice loving kindness. And then on realizing its significance, the Lord, the Buddha, uttered on that occasion an inspired utterance. Trivial thoughts, subtle thoughts, mental jerkings that follow one along. Not understanding these mental thoughts, one runs back and forth with a wandering mind. Now this really shows the, the Buddha's teachings about calming down the mind. It's not about thinking about the Dhamma so much, but the Dhamma is about letting go of thinking gradually. Because this thinking often comes with quite a bit of tension. But having known the mental thoughts... the mindful and ardent one replaces them, lets go of them. An awakened one has entirely abandoned them. These mental jerkings that follow one along. And so the Dhamma is, ripens in release, in calming down, in letting go of discursive thought in the mind, slowly. At the beginning of the meditation, when we bring up an object, for example, to help out the loving-kindness, we are using skillfully our thoughts and imagination. But then very soon it fades away, and that's good. <laughs> that is a part of the path. And that is liberation, that is release. And that is the end of the sutta tonight.
Did you have any questions? Good. That means everybody understood okay, so everything. There's a question from Ernst. Would you like to ask a question from Dante because I don't think Dante saw it. Oh, no. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. I can it's, just ask a question. Yes, yes. Go for it. Hi, Ernst. Um, hi. How are you? Good. And you? I'm pretty good. Just about to go camping. Oh, good. But, uh, good. Yeah, uh, my question was, how do you um, activate the energy body? So, um, well, like four years ago, I started meditating and doing breath work. And it took me like four or five months. And um, I got to a certain point where I only slept like three or four hours a night. And I had very high energy all the time. And I was able to kind of work through everything very fast. But it took me so long, like half a year almost, to get to that point. Um, is there any other way that's faster that can bring me to that level again? Mm. Well, that's a good question. I, I could only say that this is not really the kind of meditation that I, I teach and practice. So the it's not my ground. I could not answer you. <laughs> I I only uh, I only could uh, s I only teach uh, the Buddha's teaching that's in the suttas directly, and so. Um, this when we speak about energy body and um, uh, some kind of breath work um, I would say this could be more I, I don't know exactly w who was teaching you this kind of uh, meditation in the in the past, but it sounds <laughs> no, like wait, a, I think I just stumbled upon. <laughs> okay, I was just kind of reading twelve books here and there, and watching YouTube videos, and just self educating from multiple sources. Okay, and good. I kind of just really focused on having a proper breath during work. Yes. Okay. So I wasn't holding my breath too long. I wasn't hyperventilating or hypoventilating or anything or just a consistent breath during work mm -hmm. um so basically i was meditating throughout work constantly which was um causing less anxiousness at work because i have a pretty stressful job so just i had a lot of extra energy because my body wasn't wasting its time on i don't know yes yes um, issues that weren't actually there yes well the closest thing that i can relate this to that i I could answer you is that um, when when you see there is high stress and this is like the stress in your mind is also in your body and to be aware of that connection and that stress mental stress comes with bodily stress also and that there's bound to be tension in your body with any kind of mental stress and any kind of un unwholesome states of mind and as you learn to see this that that's what we call this discernment or wisdom as you see what is unwholesome you see that tension that is there and then you can let it go you just relax you you release that the cause of that stress well of course it's it's your it's your job, but then it's also if it's it's making you uh, very agitated and s stressed out. Well, I don't think there's anything that is worth being uh, a bundle of stress. Uh, and so you can just like, OK, like relax and and really let that go and then awareness is just going to open up naturally as you do this and energy also because when we that's the definition of 
or not the definition, but that's what happens when we let go of craving, which manifests as tension and tightness in the body and in the mind, is that we, we don't notice how much energy we spend on holding on to things. And that is the tension right there. And that amount of energy is tremendous. <laughs> but when when that's our default operating system, we don't notice it anymore so much. And that's why the meditation practice is very helpful because it helps us going layer after layer deeper into seeing, oh, what we're holding on to. And um, as we learn to open up, and let go of any tension, any tightness. Uh, in fact, there's a really clean and bright kind of energy that naturally comes up along with awareness. And now I'm, not, I'm only speaking about the seven factors of awakening. That's simply mindfulness, and then there's investigation of the Dhamma, that's the second one. That just means discernment, that just means seeing that there's stress that arose, that is tension, then letting it go. And then the third one is energy. From that work, there is energy arising. And it's not like Red Bull energy, don't get me wrong, it's really... It's really clean, pristine, aware kind of energy. And that just arises on its own. That's, that's the nature of these seven factors of awakening. One brings out the other. And then from that energy, there is, there is joy. And then joy, when the, the mind is joyful, there is tranquility. The, the body and the mind become tranquil because they're not looking outside of themselves anymore they're just happy here and now that's the nature of inner joy and then and then from from tranquility there is um collectedness and then steadiness of mind and we learn to balance and bring up these seven factors of awakening uh, I, I do not teach breath work. Uh, the, 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 the thing that I, that I teach is uh, mindfulness of breathing is more uh, not, not really focused on the breathing, but it's more uh, if we read the Buddha's instructions in the original text, the original suttas, it is in fact about relaxing any tension in the body and any tension in the mind and bringing up joy every breath so every breath breathing in relaxing the body breathing out relaxing the body breathing in with joy breathing out with joy breathing in happiness breathing out happiness that these are the actual instructions of the the buddha in the suttas and um As we learn to let go, energy arises. <laughs> Does that kind of answer your question? Um, yeah, there's no perfect text, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yes. Good. Yes, Iran. May I also, um, um, I'm just trying to think on behalf of that question when you brought Ernest. He was um, mentioning that how you can be um, hyperactive uh, um, in, in a constantly sort of thing. And what I think about that, one moment. What, what I thought about that, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that was that uh, when we practice uh, this wholesome um, meditation, we can feel our happiness, but if we 
uh, spend that happiness in an overdrive, we lose it as well. Um, so it's like how you max up out your credit card. Uh, if you spend it, and uh, you know it takes so much effort to come back to your initial um, stage. So although you can build that up, it's not wise to just um, be hyperactive and uh, spend it, spend that energy, that good piece of um, sort of energy, uh, just like that. So just want to put it out there for you, Ernest. Yeah, I, I like to spend my energy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But um, yeah, I understand what you're saying. That's kind of what happened um, last time I got to that point where I became pretty hyperactive, but it wasn't sustainable at all. So I was working and doing other things like you know, 19, 20 hours a day. So <laughs> I get what yeah. you mean because I've meditated and I've gotten to um, certain higher energy levels. But what I realize it's not. Um, at least as lay people to just maintain that sort of energy level. Maybe if you um, advance and you let go of a lot of things, probably you can sustain there. But I don't, I don't think it's possible like that to just constantly do that. Okay. Anybody has any other question? All right. But they, uh, um, can you explain a, a little um, bit about um, the difference between the Raga Duesha Moha and Sita Samadhi Prajna? That should help a lot of people here. If they have time, of course. Uh, so, about uh, desire and uh, anger and delusion? Is that what I'm hearing, and how it and then, how it relates to how how, how it is um, different from Raghadeva Shimoha to um, Sila Samadhi Prajna? Is that the opposite? Oh, well, so basically, just just to put things in 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 order. Uh, greed, hatred, and delusion, or which is just, uh, or selfish desires and um, impatience or anger, and then uh, lack of mindfulness. These are the three unwholesome roots that the the Buddha discovered and taught. That these these are the the root of all things unwholesome, of all things that are um, bound up with tension. And to basically learn through the threefold training, sila, samadhi, panya, like you said, um, which is the eightfold path um, that we've been studying a little bit, um, we learn how to this is the goal of the entire Eightfold Path, is to learn to first see these, the greed, the hatred, and the delusion. And then these are big words, but really it's, it's, it can all be boiled down to tension. It's, it's uh, these unwholesome states, they, they, these states are uh, obsessive, they're not mindful. They, have lack of mindfulness within them uh, and they are conditioned in our own behavior through time through repeated action and reaction and so to learn to first see the very uh, strong desires that are not so wholesome for and not so good for ourselves they're uh, they're simply pulling us out of contentment all the time. Not to eradicate all kinds of desires at all. That's not the Buddhist teaching. In fact, it's about cultivating um, 
wholesome desire which gradually will bring up to liberation. But at the same time, we, uh, we, when we learn to discern these states with wisdom and see, oh, this anger, <laughs> when we get angry, I'm not very happy when I'm angry. So we, we learn to wisely abandon these and that's the practice and to see first because that's the tricky part anger is reactive anger is an obsessive state it's not we're not mindful when we get angry <laughs> we're just reacting we're in full-on reaction mode and so the problem lies in this and that the first step is that we need to see this we need to see have the mindfulness, the openness of mind, the clarity of vision to first see, oh, I'm getting angry, angry here. <laughs> and, then, and then through this process, first, that's the first noble truth, we have to see it, we have to recognize it, and then we can let it go. That's the third noble truth, the end of tension. And that's really the Buddhist teaching. It's not just about seeing mindfully things, it's about letting go of the unwholesome and cultivating the wholesome. Then mindfulness arises. Mindfulness is a byproduct of right effort, which is abandoning anger and un unskillful states, anger and strong uh, outward desires, and replacing them with wholesome states reconditioning our minds so that it is present, happy, aware, uplifted with loving kindness, with generosity, with virtue, with non-harming, with compassion and equanimity. And not an equanimity that is indifferent, an equanimity that is very happy and uplifted, like a blissful equanimity. It's not uh, an indifferent, it's a very mindful state, in fact. I hope this answers your question. <laughs> okay, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Good. All right. So, are we... We have any more questions? See, Gray. Is something on your mind? It's close to bedtime, is it? Explain that one. He explained that one already about food. He's very, he's very oh. curious. Mm. Oh, food. food. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, but he did. He did want to know. Do you want to ask? Why have many? Why food? And what, what was your other question? <laughs> <laughs> he was asking. Um, what food do you like? Oh, oh, that's a tricky question. That's a tricky question. <laughs> yes. The food that's in my bowl. <laughs> yes, that's the food that I like. Yes. <laughs> Good. He's totally building up the courage. He, when it's on yeah, that's what. Start asking questions. And that's ask a. Him now, it's ask a him very, him very good question. <laughs> that's what he keeps saying. I asked Ponte now. <laughs> I can't good. ask right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's part of our practice. That is part of our practice, Gray. We practice contentment. So whatever people put in our food in our bowl. We, 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 we like it, we enjoy it, that we, we are happy and we, uh, we send them loving kindness. That's what we do. 
Maybe that was a bit complicated, but... <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> good. All right. Well, we can share our merits, and that will be it for tonight. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And I wish you a very beautiful week, and I hope everything goes right for you, and that you're happy and protected and uh hope we see you next next week thank All you right. thank you <laughs> take, take care, care. yes Bye, thank everyone. you terence bye bye, -bye. bye.